Welcome into the Bear Report podcast. We are going to break down the 2023 NFL Scouting Combine. This is officially over in Indianapolis. Things wrapped up here on Sunday with running backs and offensive linemen going through drills. Six days of interviews, drills, meetings, all that good stuff. And it was another fun one in Indianapolis. I'm your host, Zach Pearson. I'm joined by Usaid Kosho. We're going to break down some big talking points um, from the 2023 NFL scouting combine in relation to the Chicago Bears. And right away, let's just kind of kick it off with the quarterbacks. It's a position the Bears feel like they have their guy at, Justin Fields. But looking at this NFL draft, the Bears hold the number one overall pick. They want a team to come up and get a quarterback. And looking at how Anthony Richards had performed, Will Levis, C.J. Stroud, all three performed well, whether it was testing, interviews, on-the-field stuff. And that's good news for the Chicago Bears because now the price of the number one pick likely went up. And the Bears are going to have teams here calling, whether it's Indianapolis, whether it's um, Houston, whether it's the Las Vegas Raiders, the Carolina Panthers, Tennessee Titans. Teams like that are going to call up, maybe even a couple of surprise teams. And I feel like the Bears here were the big winner of the combine due to the quarterbacks actually performing well throughout the week. You're right. It's such an interesting dynamic because we went into this whole thing knowing that it was going to be one and two, CJ Stroud, Bryce Young, depending on how teams kind of had evaluated them, graded them out. And then all of a sudden later in the week, we get Will Levis having a really nice combine, Anthony Richardson having a phenomenal combine, which if you're going to talk to me about who increased their stock the most, I would probably say it's Anthony Richardson who just absolutely blew up at the combine. And so this is going to create such an interesting dynamic because for the bears, I mean, everyone knows the bears are trading out of first overall. It was pretty much confirmed when Adam Schefter tweeted it a couple weeks ago saying that, Hey, look, it's the worst kept secret in the NFL. And now all of a sudden you're in a situation where there's going to be five, six, seven teams looking to trade up for a quarterback. We're seeing reports like the Panthers possibly trading up for a quarterback, making a jump from ninth overall to the first, basically top three to five picks. We're seeing the Seattle Seahawks who said they believe in Geno Smith, but aren't going to rule out drafting a quarterback. And then one of the biggest dominoes of all, kind of what happens up north with the Green Bay Packers. I'm not saying the Packers are going to trade up for a quarterback, but whatever Aaron Rodgers decides to do, is going to kind of dictate what the quarterback market looks like over the next six to eight weeks. And so this is more than anything, right, fun to watch if you're the Bears because you could come away with multiple first-round picks here. And you could be in a situation where you are basically looking at the next three to four years in Chicago where it's just draft picks on draft picks simply because of – the way that this combine has shaped up to be. When you look at the off season, it's, it's Aaron Rodgers is going to hold the keys to everything. It, his decision is going to open the door for all the quarterbacks for Derek Carr, um, where Jimmy Garoppolo signs, you know, then Lamar Jackson's a big factor as well. Um, you know, Rogers is going to have three decisions, retire, play for green Bay or get traded. You know, I don't think the Jets are going to move up for number one. Um, if he goes to the Jets, you know, that takes a team off the board for other quarterbacks. If he goes to the Raiders, you know, it takes a team off the board. If he stays in Green Bay, all options are open. Kind of the same thing with Lamar. If they franchise tag him, get a deal done with them. Whatever happens with his situation. And I think once Rodgers makes his decision, um, you know, it's March 5th. I'm guessing it'll come within the next week or two weeks. Um, kind of sounds like it'll, it could come this week. I just, it's going to open the door for everything. It's going to be the biggest domino of the fall. And, you know, the hope is that you have a lot of these teams sitting there needing a quarterback still. You know, Carolina, Indianapolis, Houston, Las Vegas, Tennessee, Atlanta, um, maybe Seattle. A lot of these teams that need a quarterback can go up and trade for number one. And with the quarterbacks performing well, you know, it's just it just means the price of the pick is going to go up. The Bears are going to get a package they probably are seeking with multiple first round picks, um, and they're going to be able to trade the pick away. Now, where do they land? That's going to be the biggest thing. That's kind of my next talking point. Is ideally you land in the top four still, um, which makes Houston and Indianapolis the top two candidates um, because you look and you have Jalen Carter 
depending on what happens with him, um, and Will Anderson. And the whole Jalen Carter thing was kind of crazy being there and waiting for him to talk. Uh, didn't talk, obviously. We kind of have to watch where that goes and, and where that plays out. Um, that's going to be very important. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to say the Bears are officially wiped him off the draft board, but listening to Will Anderson talk, listening to have him having the confidence, um, what I heard is meeting went really well with the Chicago Bears. I think he's going to be the number one player on their board now. I think unless Jalen Carter has a big pro day and kind of won the Bears over maybe at the combine with his meeting, um, I, I think Will Anderson's got to be the, the top prospect on their board um, in, in terms of getting a, a legit defensive talent. Now, they fall out of the side of the top four, then you kind of open it up for things. You go to left tackle, Peter Skronsky out of, out of Northwestern, um, Paris Johnson out of Ohio State. Do you go with a wide receiver if you're sitting at the top, you know, just outside the top 10? Do you go with Tyree Wilson out of Texas Tech as another edge rusher I thought had a nice combine and, and might have won some teams over? That's going to be the focus. For me, I think Will Anderson is number one uh, on the Bears draft board. As of right now, tentative to change. Yeah, the Will Anderson, Jalen Carter dynamic is so interesting because if you remember throughout the season, I mean, people were begging and screaming for Carter over Anderson specifically because they said the Bears got to get this three technique figured out in Matt Eberflus' defense. And quite frankly, that's still true. They need to get the three tech figured out. But when you look at the bigger picture here, I mean, I thought that the defensive line group performed really well at the scouting combine, and that kind of gives the Bears a lot more flexibility in terms of how they want to go about approaching this thing. Early consensus kind of before the Jalen Carter news broke would probably have been, hey, listen, we want to go ahead and we're going to take Jalen Carter. Now all of a sudden with the way that Will Anderson kind of burst on I mean he was always on the scene but this combine I think just reinforced just how great of an athlete and how great of a person how great of a player he really is it wouldn't be surprised to see the Bears in fact go after Will Anderson and why because you're looking at a defense that doesn't really have any true building blocks in the front seven we're still split on some of these guys that kind of emerged last year, like a Jack Sanborn. But what the Bears are really going to get if they decide to go with the Will Anderson route is kind of the next great defensive leader for at least a generation in Chicago. I mean, outside of all the talk with how bad the Bears were last year in terms of front seven, I would think that you can't pass up on adding a guy like Will Anderson, looking at some of the other guys like a Tyree Wilson, Miles Murphy, Brian Breesey. Okay, those guys are great options, but they are still a tier below a guy like Will Anderson. Yeah, and, you know, free agency is going to depend or is going to make change some things here. You know, if the Bears go out and land a big nose tackle, three technique at, in free agency – it could change their focus. If they go out and land somehow an edge rusher, I know it's not a great edge rushing class um, for defensive linemen in terms of free agency, you know, maybe they go Jalen Carter. So I think we got to kind of wait and see on the free agency. They could double up too. They could surprise us and maybe double up on one of the positions. But I, I just, I don't think you could go wrong with either player because they do address a major need. I think with Will Anderson, you got the chance to get a potential legit pass rusher um, for the next, you know, seven, eight, nine years with Jalen Carter. You know, maybe you get a guy in the middle that could clog up the run lanes and be a force at the three technique, which is very important um, for Matt Eberflus' defense, as he's noted several times. But, you know, like I said, free agency could change things. I, you know, me, I have Will Anderson number one. Um, but, you know, if they go out and find someone, maybe they switch to Jalen Carter. And, and maybe if they sign a nose tackle, it stays Will Anderson. Um, flipping over... Justin Fields, one thing that I saw a lot of and I heard a lot of while down there was praise for Justin Fields. Um, whether it be, you know, players in at the combine that are working out, you know, um, prospects, they were asked about Justin Fields a lot. Um, the general consensus I got from being out there in Indianapolis talking to people in the media, associated with teams and stuff, like Justin Fields, they think he's the real deal. Um Obviously, they would want to keep Justin Fields. I did talk to a few people that thought the Bears should trade him. Um, that's outside Chicago, so they kind of really don't know the full story here. But it's nice to see that Justin Fields is getting this praise 
And they always say, like, the people on the field, you know, hear these NFL players talking about Justin Fields and praising him throughout the year and now in the offseason as well. Um, I heard Adam Thielen on the broadcast said something about Justin Fields and praising him. The players on the field down there, they know first. They know if the guy's got it. And it seems like a lot of these guys know Justin Fields has it. And the thing that I want to note, though, is Ryan Poles pretty much – said without saying that they're still committed to Justin Fields. That's the plan, he said, um, for him to be the starter. And I think barring anything crazy, he's going to be the starter. But Ryan Poles also said they, he, you know, he has to get better. He has to take that next step in certain areas of his game. Reading defenses, um, getting the ball out, not always tucking in run, not having to make that quick decision and forcing it into a, tur- a, a turnover, things like that. So while he is the guy for them, um, and he's getting praise. That's not to say he's going to come out and dominate in 2023. He's still got to improve, and he's got to learn, um, you know, throughout the offseason how to improve and, and how to get better as the season goes on. You mentioned such an excellent point there because Ryan Poles, when you kind of go back and listen to that quote, he didn't say, oh, Justin's limited because of his physical potential. Like, everybody knows Justin's got the physical specimen to be a phenomenal quarterback in this league more so what ryan was alluding to was the mental aspect of the game in terms of hey make smarter decisions also make quicker decisions at times don't just listen to your first instinct all the time tuck the football and run away you do have to get better when it comes to getting the ball out faster i mean ultimately anyone who saw justin play in 2022 should have come in with the takeaway that listen the reality for him is that it's not even the physical anymore it's just more so the mental aspect of the game and again some of that goes back to the bears and that week seven game against new england in 2022 which was a true turning point in the season the other half of it goes back to the fact that as long as you and i have kind of covered justin you know we've been at hollis hall there's always just been that vibe in the air from him in terms of hey i'm cool i'm calm i'm collected i'm going to do whatever it takes to get better i think it's truly different because at times this past season you could argue that justin was the best player on the field and quite frankly we have to be honest with ourselves about something like we used to the nfl the way it's going it's like they're marketing players like crazy now you know you go to a game to watch a patrick mahomes for example or a josh allen you know you go to a bears game this year to watch justin fields and that's why everybody i think really seems to be taking notice simply because there were times this year justin did do his best to take games over now polls being objective is good simply because we need to also acknowledge that Justin was not Ryan Poe's guy and Ryan didn't necessarily hint at moving on from Justin but part of me also says I'm not saying Justin's not the guy but part of me is also like this regime's gonna be ready to move on from Justin in another year or two if it's very clear that it's not panning out yeah and and you know that's something that people probably don't want to hear that's something I hope doesn't happen because if if you know, Justin Fields is good. It's not going to happen. But if the Bears trade that number one pick, which I think they're going to, and they pick up an extra first round pick next year, that pick's very, very likely going to be in a top 10 again, potentially top five, unless the team just has a complete turnaround um, or, or, you know, maybe let's say Baltimore comes up and, and trades and they're like a piece away or a team that's a piece away at the quarterback position. Um, you know, then it's going to be outside that top 10. But if you get a top 10 pick next year, you'll have potentially two top 10 picks. If Fields isn't good and the Bears struggle, you'll have the ammo to go up and get Drake May or Caleb Williams because next year's class is just way better than this year's class from, from the early scouting that a lot of people have done, including myself. I mean, this, this upcoming class is going to be one where, you know, you might have two generational talents. Now, um, That's a good point because, you know, you don't often get the chance to pick your own quarterback in the NFL as a GM um, in the top three or four like Ryan Poles has a chance to do this year. Now, they're not going to take a quarterback. I'd be absolutely shocked if they did in the first round this year. Um, I think they could take like a developmental guy later on in the draft. But if things go downhill and Fields does struggle and, 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 you know, Poles has to make a move, 
they'll take a quarterback next year. And they're kind of in a win-win position because you get another year of Justin Fields on a rookie contract who's already shown you potential. He can be the guy. But if he flames out, something happens, you have the, the chance to take another another quarterback next year. Yeah, you're right. And, I mean, let's just be honest. This is not a year-to-year type thing. It's sort of like a few years to few years type thing where you can't just help but think down the road, especially knowing how badly the Bears have kind of mishandled the quarterback position. Like you look at it, and this is one of the things I wrote in my open discussion post that I've released periodically throughout the off season, but it's like the one domino that some of these quarterbacks over the last couple of years have had, you look at a Brian Dable, I'm sorry, you look at Josh Allen, you look at Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, even it's like, They've constantly had that continuity at the offensive coordinator position, at the head coaching position. You know, Josh Allen had Brian Dable and Ken Dorsey as his quarterbacks coach slash offensive coordinator. Joe Burrows had Brian Callahan forever. You've got Mahomes who had Eric Bieniemy, as well as Andy Reid. The Bears, though, you look at the last two times they've made any sort of investment in a quarterback, and what has it been? It's kind of been, you know, Jay Cutler and Mitch Trubisky, and then Cutler had Mike Tice, Mike Martz, you know, Aaron Cromer, Dowell Loggins. Trubisky had Bill Lazor, Loggins, you know, a whole bunch of these other guys, Adam Gates even. So for the Bears to kind of retain Luke Getze this offseason and then Luke Getze to be there at the Combine, I think it kind of speaks to – they're trying to do this the right way and not just do it the right way, but they're doing right by Justin, by committing to him and saying, Hey, we're going to give him a fair shot, even though we haven't necessarily hitched our wagon to him. Now, part of also giving Justin a fair shot is not just making him QB one, but it's also how do you go about building around him? Which again, we're going to be honest as much as we love to say the bears have the first overall pick and they can create more draft capital and they can, go ahead and they've got like 98 million in free agency, you know, the resources are going to dry up rather quickly once the spending begins because everyone's talking about sign and draft this guy in free agency, go ahead and draft this guy. But no one's also accounting for some of the Bears' own extensions that they're going to need to possibly make such as a Cole Komet, for example, who, again, was instrumental in the development of Justin last year, as well as the offense. They got to surround him with talent. Um, that's the biggest thing. They have to surround Justin Fields with talent. And I think they're going to do that, whether it's wide receiver, whether it's, you know, free agency, the draft, um, you know, maybe get another tight end. They have to surround him with talent. One area I think they're going to do that in is offensive line. And, you know, we like to go in this offseason and think, okay, you know, the Tevin Jenkins – locked in at starter right guard. Braxton Jones locked in at starter left tackle. I don't know if that's fully the case. I imagine it will be. Um, listening to Ryan Poles, you know, he had an interesting quote about we're always trying to get better um, on the offensive line. And for me, I kind of took that as, okay, they're probably going to come out, address it in, in, in free agency. They're going to address it in the draft. We could look at a situation where, Tevin Jenkins and Braxton Jones are both moved to different positions or one of them's moved to different position. Um, more than likely, you know, if you can go out and get a left tackle, you move Braxton Jones to the right side. Um, you go out and get a right tackle. They probably stay put. Um, I think the biggest key to this is center. What do they do with Lucas Patrick? You give him another shot. Um, Ryan Pohl seems to like him a lot. Um, it would not surprise me if they kept him, moved him to center, gave him the full year at center because he barely got the year at, at center this year dealing with injuries um, and then was swapping with um, uh, Tevin Jenkins. And then what do you do with Cody Whitehair? And I don't know what they're going to do. I think they're going to look at their options um, in free agency. They're going to look at their options in the draft. It would not shock me if they brought in four to five offensive linemen through the free agency and draft combined. Now, I'm not saying all four or five will be starters, but, you know, bringing in some guys, maybe rolling with Patrick, J- uh, Jenkins, and Jones, and then bringing in two new starters. I think the one position they really have to find a starter, right tackle. Um, and again, that could be perhaps Jones moving to the right side, or it could just be signing a right tackle. You get that right tackle, I think you can live, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with, having Jones, having Jenkins, and having um, Patrick and Whitehair um, with, with one new addition. I do think they'll draft a guard 
um, to kind of come in and, and be ready. And I think they might, they could even draft from the second round, or if they move back and pick up an extra first, they could draft um, a, a guard or an offensive lineman. I think that is going to be the, the, the unit to kind of watch, especially free agency early on, especially in the draft. I don't think any move they do in free agency on offensive line will dictate the draft. I think they could double up on offensive line, triple up, quadruple up. I, I think Ryan Poles knows he has to build the trenches. Heck, I mean, he said it day one. They have to build the trenches and get better. Um, I think offensive line is going to be the, the really the key position to watch. You're right. And building in the trenches is kind of the foundation of where your football team starts. When we look at Poles, Ian Cunningham, and Matt Eberflus, and again, I've noticed this, noted this on the Picks for Poles podcast too, but there's two things that stick out. Number one, those guys all come from organizations, the Chiefs, the Colts, and the Eagles, as well as the Ravens for Ian Cunningham, where they have nothing but homegrown talent. But number two, those teams consistently have this habit of just drafting offensive linemen and defensive linemen year in and year out, whether it's a high pick or a day two or late day three guy to build some depth and add some competition to the bottom of the roster. This is the most important position the Bears have to address this offseason, at least on the offense. And why? Because so many of the reasons last year that Justin took off running as much as he did is because there was relatively little to no time for him to even get his feet set to look down the field to begin reading the defense and making throws. The good news for Chicago, though, is this year it's a really good free agency class when it comes to the offensive linemen. It's a pretty good offensive lineman class, too, when it comes to the NFL draft. You know, everyone loves to talk about the local Northwestern kid, Peter Skaronski. And, again, that stuff is – deserved right northwestern we've kind of seen they've sent some solid offensive linemen to the nfl over the last couple of years um rashawn slater for the la chargers is one of those guys then you go ahead and you look at kind of what to expect in free agency i know the big name that everyone wants to kind of target and talk about is right tackle Jawan taylor in ideal world the bears do sign Jawan taylor but you can't help but think how much of that is going to be an overpay knowing that the jaguars are going to try and drive his price up significantly because he's also a free agent. You look at a couple guys that kind of lit it up at the senior bowl, Tennessee right tackle Darno, right? I know people look at him and say, hey, he's too big to play in this game, but if he can do in Mobile, or if he, if he can do in the NFL what he did in Mobile during senior bowl week, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind Darnell Wright's going to be a phenomenal starter in this league. And then you kind of get to the middle of this class, right? Paris Johnson Jr. is a really phenomenal guy from Ohio State. You know, Dewan Jones, pretty good as well. I think he's a solid under-the-radar option. So the Bears are going to have their options here when it comes to rounding out this offensive line group. And you spoke earlier about some of these older guys like a Lucas Patrick, right? If I had to guess, I would say Lucas Patrick returns, but he's not guaranteed a starting spot. I would also say this. Braxton Jones did pretty good last year at left tackle. Again, he didn't blow anyone away by any means, but I also would not be surprised to see Braxton stick at left tackle unless there's a significant upgrade there because, again, as we've seen with this franchise, it's like they figure out players excel in one place, and then next year rolls around, they're doing some shuffling here and there, and those players don't necessarily excel. You know, it just makes too much sense, I think, that you don't move Braxton away from left tackle unless you know you can land a guy who is going to come in and just absolutely light it up. But, you know, even Braxton, I think, as good as he was last year, you have to have your reservations about him because you have to wonder, being a fifth-round pick, like, was last year as good as it's going to get for him or is there a legitimately higher ceiling for a player that – was the only consistent starter taking first team reps like two or three weeks in training camp when the entire offensive line combination and the reshuffling was going on. Yeah, they just can't have that shuffle in in the offensive line diffusion and and, and switching guys here and there. I, I like to see them establish a, a starting five right away and stick with that starting five. You know, let them play together. Let them get through the off season practices together, 
and let's get through training camp with them healthy preseason, regular season. Um, I do think, yeah, offensive line is going to be the key position here. Um, you say before we go, do you have any other big takeaways from the combine or anything you saw? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I think the wide receiver group really kind of was impressive. Jay, I'm sorry, Zay Flowers from Boston College, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, I thought really impressed, you know, but also there's the other half of it, which is, I don't think the hype around guys like Jordan Addison and Quentin Johnson was as warranted. I think a lot of it was more so just fan-driven. And then, hey, listen, I know I mentioned this earlier, but how about some of these pass rushers, right, testing as well as they did? I mean, if you want to talk to me about who I think the biggest winner was this past week, I would probably say amongst the pass rushers, it's Iowa's very own Lucas Van Ness. Again, he's a Chicago area native. Has some sort of relation to Cole Komet. I can't remember right now, but the point is, is simple. He, fact date, he uh, dates Komet's sister. Okay, so he dates Komet's sister. But the point I think is, is that like Lucas Van Ness has kind of shot up the boards out of nowhere. You know, going into this draft season, six, seven weeks ago, if you were to talk to me about him, I would say, yeah, he's probably, you know, a second round pick, kind of late day two guy. Now all of a sudden, I think we're going to see him be probably the third or fourth edge rusher off the board. I wouldn't even argue this in terms of the pass rushers. You're probably going to go Will Anderson, Tyree Wilson, and then you're going to have Lucas Van Ness or one of the Clemson guys like a Brian Greasy or a Miles Murphy. And the last thing here that I'll say, right, when we kind of look at the players and the prospects that the Bears were visiting with, you look at offensive, defensive linemen, you look at wide receiver. I mean, I'm not going to read too much into it, but don't be surprised come April if this is kind of how we see things go down in the sense that it's O-line, D-line, wide receiver, a combination of the three that's selected in the first three rounds for the Bears. Because when you get to day two of the draft, that's where a lot of the money is when it comes to this wide receiver class. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a really good defensive line class. I think the Bears – could find some value if they do move back um, in, in this draft. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening, watching. Um, you can follow the Bear Report on Twitter at Just Bear Report. You can follow me on Twitter at Zach, Z-A-C-K underscore Pearson. Um, you say, as you say, Coastal right there on the screen. Um, please rate, review, subscribe on all major podcasts and platforms like our YouTube channel. We'll be back with some more videos of the offseason, a very exciting offseason ahead. Please make sure to check out everything. Until next time, everyone, please stay safe.